and now the battle for a moment hovered in the zenith of its glory. The contending foes were not above ten yards asunder, and scarcely were the enemy seen to move. Tenaciously maintaining their hold of the hill, they fought with desperation, defending every inch of ground, for the precipice was near. Their hardiest veterans stood firm, their bravest officers came forth displaying the banners of their nation. The heroic example of Marshal Victor was imitated by all. Conspicuous in the front, the Marshal was recognised by both armies, waving his plume in circling motion high above his head, to fasten his troops to the hill. But his gallant deeds and surprising valour were vain against his more than equal foe. General Graham at this critical moment darted to the front, and by one short word, loud and inspiring, made naught of all the marshal's bravery and combinations. The word was, charge. Like electric fluid, it shot from the centre of the British line to the extremities of its flanks. Instantaneously followed by the well-known thundering British cheer, sure precursor of the rush of British bayonets. The guards and flankers now rushed forward, when with loud and murmuring sounds Ruffin's whole division, together with Rousseau's chosen grenadiers, were instantly in whirling motion, rolled down into the valley below, leaving their two brave generals mortally wounded on the hill, which was now in possession of their blood-stained conquerors. The battle was won, and the gallant Graham triumphantly stood on the bristling crest of Barossa's blood-drenched hill. Now, since both flanks of the enemy had been turned, they came back to back on the plain, and this steadied them, so that they continued to fire. I therefore requested Colonel MacDonald, our adjutant general, to allow me, with the survivors of the 28th Regiment's flank companies, to go out and skirmish with the enemy, whilst our line should be got ready to advance. To this, with the concurrence of Colonel Brown, who had just rejoined the battalion, he consented. We then moved forward. I saw no other troops go out. Colonel Brown was now the only officer with the remaining part of the flank battalion. After skirmishing for a short time, we were recalled. On our return, Colonel MacDonald remarked that Major Northcote, having come up with the rifles, would cover the line that he therefore recalled us, especially as Colonel Brown wished to have me with the battalion, at the same time saying in the most flattering manner that he should never forget my services throughout the day and would always be ready to testify to them when called upon. The enemy's divisions, now united, were soon formed and seemed determined to seize the boar by the tusks, but the boar was now metamorphosed into a lion. On Major Duncan arriving with his guns and sending some beautifully directed shots with mathematical precision to dress their line, Marshal Victor retired his troops beyond the noxious range. The hill being gained, and the enemy inclined, although ashamed, to retreat, General Graham sent his aide-de-camp Captain Hope to General Beguines, requesting him to bring up the two Spanish regiments originally attached to the British division. Even this turned out unpropitious. When Duncan's fire prevailed on the enemy's column to retire, Colonel Ponsonby, of the Quartermaster General's Department, by permission of General Graham, sought out the Allied cavalry and brought away the German hussars. Having wound round the western point of the disputed hill, they were seen sweeping along the plain in beauty of battle, and it is my firm belief that had they not appeared at that moment, we should have been immediately in motion to the front. We gave the Germans a cheer as they passed in front of our line, now formed. The enemy's cavalry turned round and faced them stoutly, their commander placing himself some distance in their front. As the Germans closed on the enemy, our cheers were enthusiastic. The brave French leader was instantly cut down, our cavalry charged right through their opponents, then wheeling round charged them from rear to front, one red coat always conspicuous Colonel Ponsonby. The French dragoons thus broken, Rousseau's grenadiers came to their support and forming square covered the horsemen in their retreat. Again the British troops were on the point of advancing, 
when a staff officer came galloping up to say that a fresh column of the enemy were coming on the right flank of the guards. This information alarmed us. Looking through my glass and observing them for an instant, I assured Colonel MacDonald that they were Spaniards and that I knew the regiments. However, some hesitation followed. Thus, the Spaniards who betrayed us in the morning deceived us in the afternoon. It was General Beguines who, glad to get away from La Peña, was hastily advancing with the two regiments before mentioned. A second column was seen advancing from the opposite direction, Chiclana. This was supposed to be Villat's division, who had not been engaged during the action, having remained near the Almanza Creek, in front of General Zayas. But they turned out to be the sick, marched out from the hospitals of Chiclana, who thus succeeded as a ruse in covering the retreat of the vanquished victor. Although at this critical juncture, every British soldier felt confident that a strong body of 600 Spanish cavalry, fired by the example of the gallant Germans, would ride forward against the reeling columns of the retiring enemy. Yet they never appeared. Abandoning their calling as soldiers, they remained behind, mouthing the pebbles of the beach, and thus preparing with oratorical effect to extol as their own those heroic deeds in which they bore no part and from which they studiously kept aloof. Notwithstanding the arrival of Beguines, General Graham evidently saw the difficulty and danger of making an advanced movement. The enemy, though beaten and having suffered severe loss, still retired with a stronger force in the field than the British numbered before the battle commenced. Villate's division were fresh and could easily have joined Victor. Our army was crippled, half its numbers being put hors de combat, and the survivors had been for 24 hours under arms, 16 of which had been passed in marching, and chiefly during the previous night. After having gained so brilliant a victory and defeated the enemy at all points, the British general fully expected that La Peña, awaking from his torpor, would take advantage of Victor's overthrow and lay the drowsy Spaniards on the track of his discomfited and retiring columns. But he was mistaken. Such was never La Peña's intention. At the time when Colonel Brown took up his position on the hill, the principal part of the Spanish artillery were moved along the beach road and halted about midway between the two points whence the enemy could move on to attack, the one by the western point of Barossa, the other by the eastern side of Bermeja. On this position, they halted, but with their drivers mounted, ready to start at a moment's notice for that point, whence the enemy advanced not. Thus, when Victor was perceived advancing against Colonel Brown, the great guns flew along the beach road, nor stopped until Bermeja was left far in their rear. Later, when the British troops were exposed to the hottest fire, perilously situated, their rear left open to attack by the early flight of the Spaniards from the hill. Yet La Peña gave no aid, although, had he moved forward by the eastern side of Bermeja and come on the plain in that direction towards Chiclana, he would have got in rear of Marshal Victor when the whole French army must have been destroyed or taken. But neither the roaring of cannon, his duty towards his allies, the pride of his profession, nor the independence of his country, was sufficient stimulant to rouse him forward into action. La Peña was determined not to move. Yet when subsequently cashiered for his disgraceful conduct, he had the unparalleled impudence to declare that it was a great hardship to be dismissed the service after he had gained so brilliant a victory with the Allied army. And soon after the battle, General Cruz Mergen unblushingly asserted in the public prints at Cadiz that he took both prisoners and guns during the action. Colonel Ponsonby, who undertook to refute this unfounded statement, asked me, all the other guns captured being accounted for, whether any Spaniards even seemingly assisted or were in sight when the gun, which he said he saw me in the act of charging, was captured. I replied that there was not a Spaniard in the field at the time, and that with the exception of himself and Colonel MacDonald, the adjutant general, who rode past at the time, 
No individual of any corps was in sight of the flank battalion when the gun was taken, not even the guards who, though immediately on our right, were shut out by the intervening inequalities of the ground. But with respect to his taking four guns, General Cruz Mergen was partly right, the term taking only being erroneous. After the action was over, the Spanish general found his own guns on the same spot where he had abandoned them in the morning, silent and cold, though they should have been loudly pouring forth their hottest fire against Rousseau's division when they were advancing against Colonel Brown's position. This I said that I was ready to prove, having seen the guns after the Spaniards had fled. This statement being made public, the controversy ceased, and Cruz Mergen shrank from the paper warfare as disreputably as he had fled from the field. Until late in the evening, the British general maintained his position on the hill when, seeing no prospect of a forward movement on the part of the Spaniards, he, as soon as it was dark, to prevent his movement being discovered by the enemy, retired down to Santi Petri Point and passed over the bridge of boats into the Isla de Leon. Thus terminated the celebrated Battle of Barossa, by Spaniards termed the bloody fight of the wild boar, fought under extraordinary difficulties against a gallant foe more than double in number by harassed British troops, whose gallantry called forth the admiration of all Europe and the malignant jealousy of their allies, a battle which immortalised the genius and valour of the commanding general, who coolly directed our movements until all was prepared for the bayonet. When, laying aside the personal prudence of the experienced old commander, he displayed the vigour and impetuosity of the young soldier, leading us on to the final glorious charge. It was during this charge, and when the guards and flank battalion united on the top of the hill, that Colonel Brown and I again met, he on the left of the household troops and I on the right of the flank battalion, with whom, from the departure of the colonel until his return, I was the only officer, and consequently in command. The time of my command, as well as I can recollect, was about an hour, and that during the hottest part of the action. After mutual congratulations, my gallant colonel shook me cordially by the hand, declaring that he never could forget my services on that day, and adding that should we both survive the action, he would in person present me to General Graham and bear full testimony to my conduct throughout the whole day. The colonel was fully aware that, had the author of these memoirs lagged behind in consequence of a wound received early in the action, he, on his arrival on the hill, instead of finding nearly two hundred bayonets of the flank battalion well into the charge which reeled the enemy off the hill, would not have had a single man of that battalion present to command, and must consequently have been still a volunteer with the guards. I reported to him my having charged and taken the howitzer. Here I feel called upon to state that when Colonel Brown parted to join the guards, there were not ten men of the flank battalion to be seen, and not above four or five standing near us. There was nothing for him to command, and I feel thoroughly satisfied that it was by sheer bravery he was moved. Although the battalion, when they originally moved forward, had not the slightest prospect of success, still it was absolutely necessary for the safety of the British army and the Spanish cause to push us forward. And had we not undauntedly pressed on to attack Ruffin in his position, that general would have come down in perfect order on the British troops, then in a confused mass and so entangled in the pine forest as to render any attempt at formation totally impracticable. To await an attack under such circumstances must have been attended with the most fatal results. The extremely critical situation in which the British troops were placed cannot be more forcibly expressed than by General Graham's own words in his orders of the following day. Isla de Leon, March 6, 1811. The enemy's numbers and position were no longer objects of calculation, for there was no retreat left. Under these circumstances, to hesitate in pushing forward the flank battalion, not only as select troops, but also as the only British troops regularly formed, since they had not yet been entangled in the pine forest, would have shown culpable weakness and want of resolution.
although the movement was consigning us as a body to certain destruction. At the commencement of the action, our battalion formed a little more than a tenth of the army. Yet at the close of the action, our casualties, both in officers and men, amounted to nearly a fourth of the entire loss sustained, although every regiment was well into the fight. The officers killed and wounded in the flank companies of the 9th and 28th regiments alone exceeded a fifth of the total loss of officers. There were 62, and of the flank companies there were 13, six of the 9th and seven of the 28th. But the carnage which the flank battalion suffered was never brought before the public. The casualties which took place in the different flank companies were in the official dispatches put under the heads of their different regiments. Thus the officers killed and wounded of the 9th Regiment flankers were returned as a loss sustained by the 9th Regiment, although at the time the 9th Regiment were doing garrison duty in Gibraltar. And the 28th Regiment, who formed the extreme left of the line, returned eight officers killed or wounded, whereas seven of those were of its flank companies with Colonel Brown's battalion, who were led into action on the extreme right, though the guards having moved by our rear and subsequently forming on our right, we at the close of the battle stood between the two brigades. The battle, although it lasted little more than two hours, was extremely fierce and bloody, and its results marked the gallantry of the two nations by whom it was fought. Two thousand French with three general officers were either killed or wounded and they lost six guns and an eagle. The loss on our side consisted of five lieutenant colonels, one major, 16 captains, 26 lieutenants, 13 ensigns, one staff, 51 sergeants, 1180 rank and file, making a total of 1,293, put hors de combat. But of all the army, the severest loss sustained was by the grenadiers and light bobs of the 28th Regiment, and it may truly be said that the young soldiers who filled up the vacancies left in those companies by the veterans who fell in the mountains of Galicia or at Coruna or who sunk through the swamps in Valcherin were this day introduced to a glorious scene of action. Two-thirds of the men and all the officers lay on the battlefield. One alone of the latter was enabled to resume his legs, for he had no bone broken. He continued through the fight. Twas the system of the old slashers. The flank officers of the 28th Regiment who fell in the battle were Captain Mullins, Lieutenant Wilkinson, and Lieutenant Light, Grenadiers, and Captain Bradley, and Lieutenants Bennett, Blakeney, and Moore. Poor Bennett was shot through the head whilst gallantly cheering on the men through an incessant shower of grape and musketry. On seeing him fall, I darted to the spot and too plainly discovered the cause. It grieved me that I could not stop for an instant with my dearest friend and first companion of my youth. But friendship, however fervid, must yield to imperative duty. The men were fast falling, and it required the utmost exertion to keep the survivors together, exposed as they then were, to a murderous fire of round shot, grape and musketry. My exertions at the moment were rather limping, as I had just been struck by a grape shot under the hip, which for a moment laid me prostrate. I could only cast a mournful look at Bennett, poor fellow. It may be that our firm friendship conduced to his fate. A vacancy occurred in the light company a few days before the action, and I saw that Bennett would willingly fill it up but it was an established rule, at least in the regiment, that a senior lieutenant could never be put over the head of a junior already serving in the light company. Perceiving that his delicacy prevented his asking, I prevailed upon Colonel Belson to appoint him, although my senior. With the battalion, two officers only were wounded, Captain Cadell and Lieutenant Anderson. In the flank, companies no officer escaped, and poor Bennett fell to rise no more. But after all, man must have a final place of rest, and the appropriate bed of a soldier is the battlefield. And it will be some consolation to his friends to know that never did a soldier fall more gallantly, or on a day more glorious, 
and never was an officer more highly esteemed when living, nor when he fell more sincerely regretted by the whole of his brother officers. He was wounded about noon on the fifth. The brain continually oozed through the wound. Yet strange to say he continued breathing until the morning of the seventh, when he calmly expired with a gentle sigh. A marble slab was subsequently erected in the chapel of the government house at Gibraltar, to the memory of Bennett and of Lieutenant Light of the Grenadiers, by their affectionate brother officers who unfeignedly regretted the early fall of the two gallant youths. A few days after the battle, the 28th Regiment returned to Gibraltar and the flank battalion to Tarifa, where we joyfully reoccupied our old quarters in the houses of the truly hospitable inhabitants. I was billeted in the house of an old priest, Don Favian Dirk. His sister, an old maiden lady, lived with him, and it is impossible to express the kindness and attention which I received from both. When the old lady heard that the grape shot which struck me had first passed through an orange, a ration loaf and a roast fowl, with tears in her eyes, she knelt down and with religious fervency devoutly offered up her thanks to the Blessed Virgin, who, she said, must have fed the fowl which so miraculously saved my life. A week had not elapsed after our return to Tarifa, when Colonel Brown received a letter from General Graham requesting that he would recommend any officer of the flank battalion who had distinguished himself in the late action. This was in consequence of some circumstances having come to the general's knowledge, principally through his adjutant general, Colonel MacDonald, and his quartermaster general, Colonel Ponsonby, as well as through his aide-de-camp, Captain Calvert. Colonel Brown then recommended me to the general. Having had occasion to go to Cadiz on private affairs, I carried the colonel's letter, upon presenting which the general delayed not a moment in sending a report on the subject to the commander-in-chief, with a strong recommendation, and during my stay in the Isla, I had the honour of dining every day at the general's table. In Colonel Brown's letter, which he read to me, the capture of the howitzer is stated, but is not mentioned in General Graham's report. In fact, he could not well have mentioned it, having already reported the capture of all the guns in his official dispatch. I cannot help thinking that had Colonel Brown not forgotten his promise to me, solemnly and spontaneously pledged on our meeting on Barossa Hill, and had he mentioned my name to General Graham, before that gallant officer sent off his dispatches, my promotion to a company would not have been the result of a subsequent action. We remained at Tarifa a few months longer, continually fighting for our bread, the crops, when many a lively and serious skirmish took place. It is a pleasant little town, and famous as the point where the Moors made their first descent into Spain, invited by Count Julian to avenge the insult offered to his daughter the beautiful Florinda, by Roderick the last of the Visigoth monarchs. When the Moors had been expelled from Spain, a watchtower was erected here, in which towards evening a bell rings every hour until dark. It then sounds every half hour until midnight. From that hour until three o'clock in the morning it rings every quarter, and after that every five minutes until daybreak. This custom continued down to the period when we were quartered there, and probably does so to the present time, and this bell to our great annoyance hung close to the officer's guardroom. Nothing offends a Spaniard, particularly in Andalusia, more than to insinuate even that he is in any way connected with the Moors. Should you through doubt ask a Spaniard to what country he belongs, he answers that he is a pure and legitimate Castilian not intending to say that he is a native of either of the Castiles or that he was born in wedlock, but giving you to understand that his veins are not contaminated with any mixture of Moorish blood. Yet in Tarifa, where they are most particular on this point, they still continue a Moorish custom peculiar to that town and not practised, I believe, in any other part of Spain. The ladies wear a narrow shawl or strip of silk called a mantilla, generally black. The centre of this strip is placed on the crown of the head, the ends hanging down in front of the shoulders, the deep fringe with which they are trimmed 
reaching close to the ankle. So far, this dress is common throughout Spain, but in Tarifa, the ladies cross the mantilla in front of their faces, by which the whole countenance is concealed, with the exception of one eye. This is done by dexterously lapping the mantilla across at the waist, and so gracefully that the movement is scarcely perceptible. I have seen many English and even Spanish ladies of the other provinces endeavour to imitate this sudden and graceful movement, but never without awkwardness, whereas every female in Tarifa accomplishes it in a moment. This temporary disguise is resorted to when the ladies go out to walk, and so perfect is the concealment and the dress of the ladies so much alike that the most intimate acquaintances pass each other unknown. Thus, accidents may happen, and husbands fail to know their own wives. Spanish ladies in general are very fine figures, for which reason, as I have been told, their undergarments, far from flowing, are very narrow and tied down the front with many knots of fine silk ribbon. The order for the flank companies to join headquarters having arrived, after a long and happy sojourn, we bade a final adieu to this pleasant and hospitable little town, and proceeded to Gibraltar. After remaining a few days in Gibraltar to exchange our tattered Barossa clothing for a new outfit, which the flank companies had no opportunity of doing previously, the regiment sailed for Lisbon on July 10th, on board two men of war, but a calm setting in, we were carried by the current to Chota on the African coast. Dropping anchor, the officers landed to dine with our old friends, the 2nd Battalion 4th, or King's Own, who were quartered there, but the weather promising fair, Blue Peter and a gun summoned us on board before the cloth was removed. Next morning we found ourselves off Tarifa. The whole population were on the beach kissing hands and waving kerchiefs in the breeze. We recognised them all and a recollection of the many happy days we passed there, where so oft we played and sang and danced the gay fandango, called forth from all a tear or sigh. The Tarifa ladies were famed throughout Spain for their beauty, but the charmed city soon receded from our view, and on we plodded listlessly until we came abreast of Barossa Hill, when we all hurried on deck and drank a flowing bumper with three times three cheers to the health of the gallant Graham. Continuing our course towards the land, where dwell the brown maids with the lamp-black eyes, we arrived at Lisbon on the 20th, and next day disembarked. Our field equipments were immediately put in preparation, our baggage animals were procured as soon as the market supplied, and as cheap as the Portuguese sharpers would sell, who next to Yorkshiremen are the greatest rogues known in regard to horses. Our wooden canteens were well soaked, securely to keep in what the commissaries cautiously served out. A portable larder or haversack was given to each to carry his provisions in, and a clasp knife which was both fork and spoon. Our little stock of tea, sugar and brandy was carefully hoarded in a small canteen, wherein dwelt a little tin kettle which also acted the part of teapot. Two cups and saucers in case of company, two spoons, two forks, two plates of the same metal, a small soup tureen, which on fortunate occasions acted as punch bowl but never for soup. This was termed a rough and ready canteen for officers of the line only. Hussars, lancers and other cavalry captains would doubtless sooner starve than contaminate their aristocratic stomachs with viands, however exquisite, served on such plebeian utensils. However, a frying pan was common to all ranks. Our equipment being completed, the march was announced for August 1st. Many conflicting sentiments jarred in our breasts the night before. Thoughts of the bloody battles we had gained and the prospect of a glorious campaign before us were gloomed by the recollection that not long before we had taken the same route with Sir John Moore at our head that since that period the ranks of the regiment had been thinned or swept away at Corona, Oporto, Talavera, Albuera, Barossa. Many a gallant soldier and sincere friend had been laid low since last we met at Lisbon. With these recollections we sat down to table, and eating seemed but a work of necessity, which passed in mute action. 
The cloth being removed, a bumper was proposed to the memory of the immortal Moor. It was drunk in perfect silence and, as it were, with religious solemnity. The martial figure and noble mien of the calumniated hero stood erect in the imagination and was perfect in the memory of all. But a painful recollection of the mournful state in which we last beheld him saddened every countenance. We seemed to see him borne in a blanket by the rear of the regiment, the moon acting as one big torch to light the awful procession as it moved slowly along, our men falling around him as if anxious, even in death, to follow their gallant leader and the enemy's guns firing salvos as if to cheer the warrior's last moments. He knew that they were beaten. Thus, Sir John Moore bade his final adieu to the regiment, all shattered save his martial spirit and lofty mind. These were unbroken and remained inflexible. He yielded his last breath with a sigh of love for his country and of yearning for his profession. After this toast was drunk, the band with muffled drums played, Peace to the Fallen Brave. But either the instruments were out of tune, or our souls not tuned to harmony. The music sounded mournful and low, a dark gloom like a Pyrenean cloud hung cold, damp and clammy around. We tried to shake it off, but in vain. Our next bumper was to the memory of our late gallant comrades, who gloriously fell since our last march from Lisbon, gallantly maintaining the honour of their country and corps. This toast was also drunk in solemn silence, while many an eye swam at the recollection of scenes and friends gone forever. I thought of my poor friend Bennett. This toast led to the mention of several anecdotes wherein the deceased bore the principal part. The gallant feats of our departed friends insensibly revived sentiments of a less mournful nature. The foggy vapour somewhat cleared away. Our third and last bumper was to our next happy meeting, and whosoever's lot it be to fall may the regiment soon and often be placed in a situation to maintain the glory of their country, and may they never forget the bravery and discipline which won the backplates. This sentiment was received with wild enthusiasm, and so loudly cheered by all that gloom and melancholy were frightened out of the room. The festive board gradually resumed its wonted cheerful tone. The merry song went round drowning the doleful funeral dirge. Past misfortunes and useless regrets were forgotten. We sat late and drank deep, and thoughts of the fair and of future glory alone occupied our minds. Heedless of the obstacles opposed to reward of personal merit by an all-grasping aristocratical interference, our heated imaginations presented nothing but blood, wounds and scars, ribbons and stars to our dancing vision, now becoming double and doubtful. And at last, we retired, but to prepare for advance. Such was the custom of gallant gay soldiers the night previous to opening a campaign. In their breasts the reign of ennui is but short, and they spurn presentiments and foreboding, harboured only by the feeble nerve, the disordered brain, the shattered constitution, or by those whose vices conjure up frightful phantoms to their troubled conscience. Next morning at dawn, we commenced our second campaign in Portugal. Crossing the Tagus, we continued our route through the Alemtejo and arrived at Villa Vichiosa on the 10th. Here we joined our second battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Abercrombie. It was the first meeting of the battalions since our separation at the Curragh of Kildare in 1805, and was very interesting. The old veterans of the first battalion with measured phrase recounted their feats in Denmark, Sweden, Holland, Portugal and Spain, cunningly leaving many a space to be filled up by the warm imagination of their excited young auditors. On the other hand, the gallant striplings of the second battalion with that fervent and frank ingenuousness so inseparable from youth and so rare in advanced manhood, came at once to the bloody fight. They long and often dwelt upon the glorious battle of Albuera. They told of the Spaniards coming late, that Blake would neither lead nor follow, of brigades being cut up through the over-anxiety of their commanders, of colours being taken, 
in fine, of the battle being all but lost, until their brigade, commanded by their gallant Colonel Abercrombie, in conjunction with the brave fusiliers, came up and by a combined and overwhelming charge, bore down all opposition and tore away the palm of victory already twining round the enemy's standard. The two battalions had been so severely cut up, particularly at Barossa and Albuera, that one battalion alone remained efficient for service. All the men of the second were transferred to the first. Their officers and sergeants returned to England. But since Colonel Belson was obliged to go home for the benefit of his health, Colonel Abercrombie was retained. And now, and contrary to my wishes, the colonel appointed me to the command of a battalion company. But he pledged himself that whenever the regiment should be about to come in contact with the enemy, I should have it at my option to join the light company. We shortly afterwards removed to Port Alegre, General Hill's headquarters. Here we remained some time, enjoying all the luxury of campaigning, inviting even to the most refined cockney, keenest sportsman, or most insatiable gourmand. Races were established, partridge shooting was good, and General Hill kept a pack of foxhounds and entertained liberally. He felt equally at home before a smoking round of beef or a red-hot marshal of France, and was as keen at unkenneling a Spanish fox as at starting a French general out of his sleep, and in either amusement was the foremost to cry, Tally-ho! or, There they go! As his aide-de-camp, Captain Curry, was married, the amiable Mrs. Curry always dined at the general's table, so that we neither forgot the deference due to beauty nor the polished manners of the drawing-room. But a union of so many sources of happiness is transient in the life of a soldier. Towards the middle of October, a division of the French Fifth Corps, commanded by General Girard, moved through Estremadura to collect forage and provisions for the army at Portugal crossing the Guadiana at Merida and approaching the Portuguese frontier near Cacheres and Aliceda. In consequence, the British troops marched out of Port Alegre on the 22nd and the head of our column reached Albuquerque in Spain on the evening of the 23rd. General Hill was here informed that the enemy had retired from Aliceda to Arroyo de Puerco and that Aliceda was again in possession of the Spaniards. However, to secure that country, Aliceda was entered on the night of the 24th by a British brigade, some Portuguese artillery and a portion of cavalry. Whilst at Casa de Santillana, about four miles distant, a similar force was stationed. The enemy's advanced guard were driven out of Arroyo de Puerco on the morning of the 25th by the Spanish cavalry, commanded by Count Pene Villamur. The fugitives moved upon Malpartida, their main body being still at Cacheres. The British and Portuguese troops following the route of Villamour's cavalry, after a forced march which continued throughout the night of the 25th, arrived on the morning of the 26th at Malpartida, and here we learned that the enemy had during the night moved upon Cáceres. During this morning, General Hill was informed that Gerard, with the main body of his troops, had moved from Cáceres but in what direction none could tell. In this uncertainty, together with the inclemency of the weather and the fatigue caused by our previous night's forced march, the general judged it expedient to halt for the day. The Spaniards, however, moved on to Cáceres. Towards night, the general having received positive information that the French had directed their course upon Torremocha, we were put in motion at three o'clock on the morning of the 27th, but during our march we were informed that the foe had evacuated Torremocha that very morning, with the avowed intention of occupying the town of Arroyo Molinos for that night. All our information seemed to be at variance, yet all was perfectly correct. General Hill now bent his line of movement, and by a forced march arrived late that evening at Alquesca, unperceived by the enemy. Both armies marched nearly in parallel lines during the greater part of the day and not very far asunder, but intervening mountains and a thickly wooded country prevented each from seeing the other. We now felt certain that the enemy, 
whom we had so ardently and arduously sought, were at length within our reach. Our advanced post was not above two miles from Arroyo Molinos, where Gerard rested in fancied security, flattering himself that he had deceived us by his movements, and that we were then at Caceres, toward which we had bent our course in the morning. On arriving at Alcuescar, we were all excessively fatigued from our forced marches, but while we were pitching our tents and anticipating some repose, I received an order to proceed to San Antonio, between six and seven miles distant, to carry despatches to General Hamilton, who commanded a Portuguese brigade halted at that place. I strongly remonstrated, pointing out that during a halt of some hours by which the whole army gained some repose, I had been sent far into the country to collect information from the peasantry, that carrying this despatch did not fall to me as a regular tour of duty, and above all, that I felt excessively unwilling to proceed to the rear at that late hour, knowing that the army were to move during the night and would more than probably be engaged before the dawn. However, all my remonstrances were vain. Lieutenant Bailey, then on the quartermaster general's staff, now commandant in the island of Gozo, told me that I was particularly selected by General Hill to carry the despatch, that his orders were peremptory, and that not a moment should be lost in communicating its important contents to General Hamilton. Bailey then read the despatch, which imported that, from the position which the British army occupied, the enemy could not possibly escape except through San Antonio. General Hamilton was therefore directed to place every car and cart in his possession and everything which he could collect in the place as an obstacle across the road and in every way to impede the enemy's progress should they attempt to pass him during the night and thus to give time to the British troops to come up on the first alarm. The dispatch was read to me with the view that, should I be pursued by any French cavalry patrols, I should tear it, and if I fortunately escaped, deliver its contents verbally, or if I were driven out of my road, communicate its import in Spanish to any peasant I might meet, who could perhaps creep his way to San Antonio, although I should not be able to get there. I had an order from General Hill to the Spanish general, Giron, to furnish me with a party of dragoons. The Spanish general offered me three men when, like Fauchon, I remarked that for the purpose of war they were too few and for any other purpose too many. I therefore took only one man, strongly recommended as a guide, and set off in very threatening weather for San Antonio. Arriving there without any adventure and safely delivering my dispatches, I immediately wheeled round to regain the camp, when, in addition to the lateness of the hour and the difficulty of finding my way through a dense forest, the darkened clouds suddenly burst and torrents of rain poured down, accompanied by a tempest of wind so furious as nearly to blow me off my horse. All traces of our route having disappeared, I called to the dragoon to go in front and point out the way, upon which he very coolly but respectfully replied that it was for the first time in his life he was there. My rage and consternation at this astounding declaration was such that I could have shot the fellow. And I asked him how he could think of coming as a guide through a thick forest, and over ground with not one foot of which he was acquainted, beset too by the enemy's patrols. And expressing my conviction that he must be a countryman of mine, I asked him if he were born in Ireland. The man replied that he was not selected as a guide, that he and the other dragoons, whom I had declined taking, were simply warned as an escort, but the word guide was never mentioned. As to his place of birth, he, after appropriate adjustment in his saddle and assuming true quixotic mien, announced himself a Castellano Puro. But judge my mortification at his asking me, with simplicity apparently genuine, if Ireland was in Portugal. I indignantly darted my spurs into the flanks of my unoffending high-spirited Andalusian steed, which, although never attached to the commissariat, I had selected from the breed of Bucephalus or Bullock-headed, still common in Andalusia, and remarkable for the bones which protrude above the eyes and resemble stumps of horns. We still moved forward, 
and after wandering some time in the dark perceived a fire. This was cautiously approached. The dragoon, being in front, was challenged by a sentry, whom he declared to be French, and instantly turning we both galloped off. We were wandering to and fro, scarce knowing where we were, but the Sierra Montanches, rearing its head high above the trees and appearing black amidst the dark clouds, prevented us at least from turning our backs to the place we sought and warned us not to approach too near lest we should come upon the French army. Again, we discovered a fire, which we conjectured to be that of a piquet. It rained torrents. The wind blew furiously, tearing the trees from the roots. Troops of howling wolves stalked around, and although they sometimes passed nearly between our horses' legs, we durst not fire even in our own defence, lest in so doing we should awaken the attention of a more formidable foe. Soaked through with rain, not knowing where I was, I struck my repeater, which I never failed to carry, and found that the army would be in motion in little more than an hour and a half. I became desperate. I resolved at all hazard to ascertain our true position. With this determination I alighted, leaving my cloak on the saddle, since it was too heavy to support from the quantity of rain it had imbibed. My pistols I carried in my breast to keep the locks dry. The Spaniard I prevailed upon to remain behind, between thirty and forty paces distant from the fire which burned in our front, with orders not to move unless he should hear a shot fired, when he should take it for certain that I was attacked. Then he was to ride forward at full speed, taking care not to leave my horse behind. All thus arranged, with doubtful step, I approached the fire. My preceding the dragoon arose neither from personal bravado nor from want of full confidence in the Spaniard, who I felt convinced would do his duty gallantly. In fact, I had some difficulty in prevailing upon him to remain behind, and he anxiously pleaded to accompany me, although he still felt offended at being taken for a Portuguese Irishman. My taking the lead was in consequence of the haughty Castilian having been too proud to learn any language but his own, and I happened to have had a tolerably good acquaintance with the languages of the four nations whose troops were in the field, English, French, Spanish and Portuguese. Silently and cautiously I moved forward, until I arrived within a few yards of the fire, then lying down flat on the ground and forming a kind of funnel with both hands close to the ground and laying my ear thereto, I now plainly heard words which I joyfully discovered to be Portuguese. Getting on my legs, I approached the fire with confidence. A Portuguese sentry, lowering his bayonet, demanded who I was. This being soon explained, I hollowed out to Don Diego, the Spanish dragoon, who instantly galloped forward with his sabre drawn, but not forgetting my horse. Upon asking the Portuguese corporal who commanded the PK where the English were encamped, I was much astonished at his replying, Here. I could discover no sign of an army or a camp until moving forward about forty yards in the direction which the corporal indicated, I came upon the very spot upon which my own tent had been pitched. Here I found Lieutenant Huddleston, of the company, lying under the folds of the tent, which had been blown down. I asked the cause of the darkness which reigned around, and which was the chief cause of my wandering for some hours close to the army without being able to discover it. He told me that immediately after my departure, a general order was issued that not a light should be lit, except one in the commissariat tent, and that only while they served out an additional allowance of rum, granted in consequence of our long march and the dreadful state of the weather, and that the furious tempest, which I must have encountered in the forest, blew down almost every tent which added to the obscurity.